Uh, it's my pleasure to introduce our speaker today, Steve Rogalski. Uh, he's a Senior Director of Product Management at DTL, D2L, or desire to learn uh, Anyone who has kids at school age has probably heard of the product, I'm sure. Uh, Steve's also a founding organizer of the Prairie Developer Conference, or PRDC, and I've had the pleasure of attending this conference and hearing Steve speak on a couple of things uh, where he shares his product management experience and is known for his talks and articles on story mapping, which are excellent. Uh, I have to say that if you happen to be in Winnipeg, uh, where Steve is, uh, other than attending the Museum of Human Rights, I'd also highly recommend Steve's tour of the place, which is second to none. Uh, it takes in the local highlights in quite unexpected ways. I'm sure if you reach out to him, he'd be happy to give you the tour. Um, <laughs> Steve is a, has a wealth of product management and product owner experience to share and experiences uh, in those roles, working with development and implementation teams. So his talks are always founded in real world experience. So I'm excited to hear his talk today on silent brainstorming. Uh, Steve, thanks very much for joining us and uh, over to you. Wow, thanks so much, John. I have a new tour plan for when you come the next time, by the way, so. Very exciting. <laughs> yep. All right, so I gotta make sure I have the right slide here. You should be seeing my title slide, Silence of the Collaborators, I hope, by now. We got it. Sweet. All right, so silent brainstorming, silence of the collaborators. Uh, why is this topic even matter to people? Uh, it's not just because we collaborate, but it's actually this topic is amazing because as a group of people who care about um, collaboration, communication, we care about doing it well. Uh, and when you are brainstorming, when you're trying to solve problems with your team, uh, when you're trying to bring in people um, to solve something, the technique matters. Uh, and it's really easy to inadvertently use a technique that's just gonna not only destroy your results and, uh, and just be totally inadequate, but also um, destroy the engagement in the room. So I'm gonna talk about some really simple techniques that, you, that can help you. So as John said, I work at D2L. Uh, here's some social media information that if you like. Uh, I, I've worked at D2L now for just about five years. And at the end, I'm gonna tell a little story about how we're using this technique today at D2L to help make the product better as well. Uh, it's been a lot of fun. So normally when I start these sessions, it's in person. And as you know, that's not happening. And the first thing I do is I bring up a, a flip chart like this and I stand in front of it like with a marker just like great brainstorming sessions. And I ask the room, what do you know about brainstorming? And I get all kinds of answers from the crowd, uh, like no bad ideas. And then I always make the joke, except that one. Um, people laugh, haha. -ha. Uh, I talk about no criticism. Yep, that's good. People say build on others' ideas. That's also great. Free will, uh-huh. Keep asking what else. That's a really great technique. Um, everybody contributes. So I'll call on or call out the introverts, of course. Um, you should do a lot of listening versus waiting to speak so you can hear other people's answers so you can build on those. Um, brainstorming in a group is the best or brainstorming in the group is the worst. Uh, setting a time limit or no time limit. And the last one is almost always stop when the flip chart is full. And it's really great. We get this really great idea of brainstorming uh, in the way that you probably experience a lot, whether virtually or in person, but in reality, it's pretty terrible and I do it to demonstrate that it's one of the worst ways to demonstrate because what happens is even in a group of over hundred people, it's gonna be five or six people that contributed. You certainly didn't feel engaged. It wasn't a good use of your time. There was a lot of awkward silence or people just staring. It wasn't very fun. Extroverts possibly thought it was great. Uh, when called upon, the introvert who was called out said, I like their idea and pointed at someone who else had just given an idea rather than contributing their own. And in, in the fact, we didn't get a lot of ideas or even a lot of novel ideas. This way of brainstorming, however, form, whatever format you're using in person or online is ineffective. And that's what I'm gonna show you today and how to make it better. So if you step back a little bit, most brainstorming sessions that are run this way, assume that throwing ideas around will help generate even more and greater innovative ideas. That brainstorming equals innovation or leads to innovation. They also assume that if you have an idea, you'll say it, that attendance by itself equals participation. 
And finally, if you ask people to give their ideas, they will. That inviting responses is the same as collaboration. And it is a great technique to notice who's not participating and to find ways to get them to participate. But I'm gonna show you a better way than just calling them out and inviting responses. What's reality? is that there are some people, I have pictures of my kids from like 10 years ago, by the way, in these slides, and this is one of my favorites. Uh, this is uh, pumpkin time carving. Some people participate actively. They're gonna grab those seeds and go, and they're just super eager to jump in and go, right? They want, can hardly wait to contribute. There are others who sit and wanna listen and think, look at the surroundings and react accordingly, maybe later. So knowing that's the case, anytime, we get people together to come in a meeting. We're not necessarily getting the idea, best ideas. We're just getting the ideas of the best talkers. So since it's Christmas and everyone has to watch the Elf movie, right? Where the risk is, if we're brainstorming that way, we're only getting Buddy's ideas and nobody else's. As much as we love Will Ferrell as an actor, we probably don't want just Buddy's ideas in our brainstorming, in our solutioning, in our product questions. Looking at another way, what about idea generation? Here's an experiment that we ran with my kids and I wanna run one with you. It's a little harder to do it virtually, but I want you to close your eyes and I can't see any of your videos because they're all off, but just, just humor me, close your eyes, listen to my hopefully soothing voice. I'm gonna ask you to not do something, okay? And I want you to try very hard to not, absolutely do not think about a pink elephant. Now. How many of you are thinking about a pink elephant? I've just planted the idea in your brain and it's probably based on a show of hands in most in-person meetings like this, about 60% of you have the pink elephant in your head. So you can open your eyes again. This is called cognitive fixation. That is when I say an idea, it gets in your head, even if you're trying not to. And when we're brainstorming, we're actually trying to build on ideas, not just think about a central idea. So, Today, two learning outcomes I want you to have. A new pet peeve. So this is my daughter after I tell a particularly excellent joke that she doesn't find as funny as I do. But there's a little bit of respect in those eyes if you see it. There's humor and respect. So it's a new pet peeve. When people brainstorming, brainstorm the way I showed you, I want you to realize that's not the best way, but still respectfully do so. And then I want you to understand how and why you can use silence to improve your brainstorming in any way that you're looking for, anytime you're trying to get feedback or ideas. So before we get into the science, let's step back a bit. Remember why we brainstorm. Number one, of course, we want to innovate. We want to solve a problem. Uh, we want to find a better way. But we're also doing it to create great teams. We're trying to engage a group of people, a team, because they want to um, we want to include their ideas in the solution. I mean, it's one of the great change management tricks that when it's our solution, it's way easier to implement when then versus my solution. So when we're engaging people in brainstorming, that's what it's doing. So if that's what we believe is brainstorming by the loud and the few acceptable, obviously not. And if that is what we believe is restricting our ideas to pink elephants acceptable, also obviously not. Okay, so there's my intro. Now the fun part, we get to go through some science. So there's a few studies that I'm gonna show you, but the first one, this is when I started researching this topic. I had spent time watching Jeff Patton and others, Linda Risen, run retrospectives, run facilitation groups, and then they used all post-it notes a lot. And I was wondering what the heck's going on? Why is that effective? And then I read this article, it's, you know, it's clickbait. You see it every six months or so on Twitter, something like this. It turns out the way your team is brainstorming is probably all wrong. This article references a study at Texas A&M in Texas where they studied brainstorming. And they did a very simple study. Imagine two groups of four people and then scale that so you have enough to fill the study. But two groups of four people, the setup is very easy. It's a group of four in one room, but with uh, dividers between them and they're all at a computer. So they can't see each other at all. They don't know who each are. I don't know if it's my best friend. I don't know if it's someone I like or don't like. I don't know the the gender, ethnicity, or anything about these, but just four people, and they're asked to brainstorm a question. The question is, how do we improve the university? And this first group, as soon as someone in that group of four, again, they're anonymous, but as someone in that group of four typed an idea in the computer they were working on, everyone else saw that idea. And then they just kept typing and added to that list. So at the end of the, the, end of the brainstorming session, whether it was two minutes, three minutes, they had a list of ideas. Then they had a second group that they wanted to compare to. That group, exact same setup, except 
When the first person or anybody typed their idea, nobody else in that group saw it. When the time limit happened, then they piled all their ideas together, removed the duplicates. So they're trying to compare, does showing the ideas early help or not with generating more ideas? Here is the results. The individuals working separately and later pooling their ideas had about 50% more ideas. Does that even make sense? The people who are working alone and then just pooling their ideas when we're brainstorming had more ideas. Not only that, the variety of ideas were also higher, right? So they got more novel ideas out of the group brainstorming alone and just pooling their ideas together, which is pretty interesting that this clearly shows exchanging ideas in a group leads members to become fixated, thus reducing the number of categories explored. It's exactly what I talked about before with cognitive fixation. When I gave you the pink elephant, people brainstorm on pink elephant, not on other ideas that might come up. So brainstorming alone is better than brainstorming in a group. All right, is that all true? Is that 100% true? Let's keep going. Sometimes, Debate matters, right? When we debate ideas, we can come up with more. There's the yes and in improv, which I'm sure some of you aren't. Let's talk about a study. Uh, this is 2003 study with Dr. Charlene Nemeth, uh, answer, asking the question, how can traffic congestion be reduced in the San Francisco Bay Area? And she had three groups, a control group, which was given standard brainstorming rules, right? Just these are the rules, go brainstorm. Uh, a second group, which was given the standard brainstorming rules, but we're told that it's best practice not to debate or criticize any ideas as you go. And a third group, same rules, standard brainstorming, but we're told it is best practice to debate or criticize as you brainstorm, right? So we got control group, we got criticize, do not criticize group, and we have the criticize group. What do you think their results were? The group that were instructed to debate the ideas were the most creative generating nearly 20% more ideas. Now, isn't that pretty interesting considering I just told you brainstorming alone is better than brainstorming in a group, but clearly here we see that debate is actually better as well. So what's going on there and how do we connect those? Well, first we wanna talk about this. Why is debate useful? I want you to consider a free association example and a little bit of audience participation here. You get to say things out loud and maybe your family will look and stare, but that's fine. Mine do that all the time. I want you to say the first thing out loud. Don't unmute yourself. Just say it out loud to yourself. When I say green. Now, nearly everyone says grass, at least in 1965. It's changed a little bit since then. What's interesting is that our brains love patterns. And if you're studying uh, Daniel Kahneman's work at all, thinking fast and slow, you've got system one and system two. System one is all about the patterns, like two plus two times three is six. That's a pattern in your brain. You didn't do the math, you just knew the answer versus system two is like 256 times 13. Now, mathematicians in this call could probably, maybe some of you could do it off by heart and have the pattern, but most of you could take a few moments, figure out the steps, Figure out, okay, 256 times 13, that's times 10, then add the three back in, and you could get to a number. That is system two. It's your brain actively at work versus the pattern. And what's interesting is that our brains have so many patterns, including word associations and many other things uh, in there. So when we say green and grass, boom, that word association just comes in and hits. See, 256 elephants. That's exactly right, Paul. So what we want to do when we're brainstorming is we don't, we do want to take advantage of the patterns, but we also want to break out of that. So how do we get past this layer of predictability where our system one is like, boom, attacking the answers and we want to engage system two? One more study. This one is probably the most fun for me. Uh, another study from 2003 with the same professor. We want people to get out of green grass into something like green lantern, right? So the study is pretty simple. Again, two groups of people. Imagine two pairs. The first pair is two people in the, in the study. They are shown colors. So they're shown green, blue, red, orange, whatever. And their job in the first part of the study is to just name the colors. So as green shows up, they both say green, obviously. If red shows up, they say red. And then afterwards, they're supposed to word associate on those colors. And when they did the study, they stuck within the typical list of words that we already knew in advance. There's lots of studies on word association on colors. They stuck with those typical answers. Now the second group in the study, imagine another pair. One person in that pair is in the group 
as a participant. Another one is the plant. And that plant's job was to say the wrong color. So when red showed up, they would say anything but red. They could say green, they could say gray, but it didn't matter. As long as whatever color they saw on the screen was wrong, they said the wrong thing. Now, what's fascinating is that person who was in that second pair, who was the actual person participant in the study, gave different answers and broke out of the typical answers that system one wanted. So what she found was being exposed to alternate views expanded their creative potential. When they heard somebody shout out an errant answer, they worked to understand it, which causes us to reassess, causes system two to kick in. And now we try out new perspectives and we have different answers that are above and beyond what our brain was hoping to answer. That's pretty, pretty interesting. I, I love this. So now let's put all of this together. Oh, by the way, here's your creative tip. If you, anyone is brainstorming um, the wrong way, just shout out a wrong answer and hopefully it helps people you know, to come up with new ideas. It might not be received all that well, but you can try. But when we put all this science together, it's actually a really clear story. Uh, decades of research have consistently shown that brainstorming groups think of far fewer ideas than the same number of people who work alone and later pool their ideas. And that is the key thing. You want brainstorming sessions might be optimal if a group session follows the individual session. Individuals first, group second. So you can take advantage of our brains that will give the most ideas and individuals, and then you want the debate. You want to hear weird answers from someone else to help you generate new ideas. Now, if you look at the language on here, it's like have consistently shown uh, mirrors patterns found in previous roots decades of this is academic language for holy cow, we really know this now. There's really no doubt. <laughs> that's, that's what this is. It's pretty awesome. So when you look at it at a whole, this is what it looks like. Individuals are better than groups for generating ideas. I talked about fixation. There's other answers out there, other reasons out there. And groups are better than individuals for processing and expanding on those ideas. Debate does spur new perspectives that activate system two. This is your summary. What that looks like is first you start with individuals get their ideas, then you bring it to the group and you diverge even more. And then if you wanna pick the best idea, you use the group to help you converge on that idea. So what does that actually look like anytime we're brainstorming, talking product, talking solutions, wanna bring a group of people together to, to innovate? It's really quite simple. You start with the prompt for your group. You move into everyone in silence, writing down their own answers. So uh, live, we use post-it notes a lot, but virtually we're using whatever you've got technology and then we use a mural board or some other online, um, online whiteboard to throw those answers up. Once your individual session is done, you alternate reading the ideas out loud to the group. You place your idea on the board, virt real or virtual, once you've read it. And at this round is when you want to kick in the debate. So you do want to ask questions about every idea. You do want to write down new ideas as you think of them, because that's the debate condition happening. And you just continue to add ideas until all have been read. The key thing here, it's not required for the science. But if you have a group of five people, <clears throat> have each person only read one of theirs first. And you keep going around the table until every idea is out. That means, for example, if I start with Tom, he says one idea. Uh, then John gets to say one idea, then Sonny gets to say one idea, then Milton gets to say one idea. Everyone is feeling heard and it's really easy to listen then. And everyone feels like, otherwise if we start with Tom, Tom has all the best ideas, of course. Uh, right, Tom, right, yep. And uh, then, you know, I don't feel like I could contribute. So that's one of the key things, just a little twist to this. The science doesn't require it because you're still getting the same ideas, but it helps people engage a little bit more. So if you compare the steps there to the science, they're really quite simple. The science says prompt without fixation, and that is the key. So if you've ever sent out a meeting invite that says, hey, I think we should solve this problem and here are my ideas, you've just fixated your group. By the way, that's pink elephanting, right? You don't want a pink elephant. Then you generate or write in silence and then you process out loud. That's, that's really, really simple science to help you. But I wanna go back to something we just talked about how the science is awesome. It's gonna help us innovate. But I wanna look at the second reason we brainstorm. The second reason, reason we involve groups is to create great teams. And after I've told you how awesome the science is, I'm just gonna tell you that it might just be secondary. Because silent brainstorming encourages all the things we care about, giving up power, handing out ownership, 
creating engagement, building better teams, and even building better products. And it's in all the management books, Radical Management, Steve Denning, Law of Empowerment, John C. Maxwell, et cetera, et cetera. These are the things that actually matter more than the science. So a couple of patterns you can use just to show you, and then we can go into the Q&A. Hopefully you're doing retrospectives. I really hope you are. They seem like the most powerful thing for me. And you can add some brainstorming in. So it doesn't matter what your prompt is, but this is a prompt with the five, you know, do the same, do more, do less, start doing, stop doing. But there's so many ways that we do retrospectives. Uh, prompt without fixation, let people write and again, gather those ideas in silence, discuss them out loud. You can even do silent grouping, which is a lot of fun. But the fun part I haven't talked about is voting in silence. Again, we don't want the group thing to happen here. A uh, really simple way to vote in silence is you number all the post-it notes, one to 12, one to 20, whatever there is, and you ask everyone to give you, and virtually we just do this with a DM in the, in the chat, uh, send me your top three, and then I tally them, and then we look, and you can see at the bottom, this idea over here in the bottom with six votes is the top one, and we look at that and say, hey, is that our top one? So that's retrospectives. And really, anytime you're doing some sort of brainstorming, you can use this technique. It doesn't have to be even all that complicated. But I want to talk a little bit how we're using with product as well. Um, over the last year and a half or so, I, we have ran an activity, this Speedbot activity, with over 250 different students, teachers, et cetera, across the globe, trying to understand this is particular exercise is you are in the boat, pretend you're in the boat. Where are you trying to go with that boat? What are your goals? What's helping you get there? What's in the product or a partnership with you is helping? And what are the anchors? What are those things that are slowing you down from getting your destination? We've actually used this along with other research to help us identify our strategy for the next few years. Really powerful, but it's even more powerful as a story going to our clients and saying, hey, we wanna do this with students. We wanna do this with teachers. We wanna get their feedback into the product. And then going back and telling the story, like we got their feedback, here's the story, here's the problems they think we should solve and what the problems we are going to solve over the next while. Really, really powerful. So in closing, in order to reach every learner, uh, in order to reach every participant even, uh, there's really two simple rules, generate in silence and process out loud. That's it. Thank you so much. That was great, Steve. Um, and, you know, because it was so good, we're not even going to penalize you for going over your 15 minute time box. I totally did. I loved it. No, no, it was it was great. That that was fantastic. Uh, just a reminder, folks, a couple of questions have already come in privately to me through the chat. Please feel free to throw questions in the chat if you'd like or just send me a note saying that you'd, you'd like to ask Steve a question uh, because we will actually uh, spend a couple of minutes now uh, going through these because there are some some good questions, Steve, that have come in. I'm, I'm curious, one of the things that I've um, uh, I've seen in, in organizations is that they, they tend to default to their standard way of doing things. They're used to doing things in a certain way. They brainstorm things in a, in a certain way, you know, and the manager is always the smartest person in the room anyway. I'm curious, how you've introduced this both inter, inter, internally in your organization and also externally with your customers. The, the secret word is, hey, can we try something? That's really the secret phrase. And it's a secret phrase for so many things. Um, I got more brave with saying that over the years, for sure. And it's easier when you have some positional title as well. But when I was a coach or a consultant coming into companies, even then I found ways to say, hey, what if we try something? Um, and, and we just bring out the post-it notes and just try it. And people are like, oh, that's really cool. Everyone engaged and our retros have been really not great in the past uh, because we haven't got a lot of engagement. And it, it catches on so quick and people are really like, hey, can we try something is our magical words. Did you have to do it multiple times for people to catch on? How quickly did people no. uh, really? No, hey, no. Hey, Steve. Yeah. Uh, would you mind just um, stopping the share? Uh, I think people have had a chance now to grab your content info and then we'll uh, be able to you as your uh, as you're speaking. Thanks. Yeah, sorry, uh, Jeff, you were asking a question, but I appreciate it. Yeah, no, I was just wondering if you've had to introduce this multiple times to folks in order to get those sorts of responses. No. Uh, because even I think about our last, my last year and a half or so doing this on client sites and then virtually, um, often at the end of the session, I'm like, that was a really cool technique. Can I use that? I'm like, of course, it's not even mine. Just go ahead and use it anytime. Uh, it's really simple. Uh, people get it right away and see that it's valuable. I, 
I, even just the sheer number of ideas you will have on your first time use this versus your usual one if you're not using silent brainstorming. I my, when I first was learning this, again, this is about 10 years ago, I kept a spreadsheet and I watched as other people facilitated and I counted the number of participants and the number of ideas. And then I switched to brainstorming, silent brainstorming, did the same count. And was like, oh, it's, it's like this science is wrong. I'm getting like 200% more ideas and 400% more engagement. It was amazing. That's really cool. Somebody's asked the question in, in the chat window here for me, and, and they're talking about trying to do this with um, a group. And it was it was prefaced, uh, you know, for everyone to come uh, to the meeting having done some brainstorming. You know, come with your yeah. ideas, um, and and no one showed up with any ideas whatsoever. So, <laughs> how do you, you know, did we miss something? So first of all, it's something I didn't talk about, but a lot of people do like to know the questions in advance so they can think about it. And you will find the one in a thousand who does prepare in advance. It is not very many. But a common practice I do have is when I'm setting up a meeting for this, I will ask the question in the in the meeting invite. This is the agenda. Here are the three questions we're going to answer. Please do not share your answers in advance. Uh, but because it's only one in a thousand, and I think that's probably pretty accurate, who actually prepare in advance with a list, I always give time like, hey, some of you may have prepared, but I'm going to give you all time just right now. And it only takes about five minutes uh, to generate a list of ideas for a question that people are pretty familiar with, which could be retrospective question or a solutioning question or whatever. Yeah, that was going to be my follow up question to that is how much time do you allow for people to yep. come up with their ideas? So can you all see my video? If you can't see it, like in person, it's really, really easy because they'll start. And again, especially if you're doing post notes, I'm going to grab my Sharpie and post it because I always have those. They start and if you just by their head down like this and they're writing at the table and their head down and eventually they start to lean back and they lean back, then they look up and then they look at me and I've, I think it was agile, uh, the mile high agile. I did this and it was like this packed room with about 300 people in it, and every one of them did that. And when I was like 75% of them are looking at me, I'm like, all right, that's good enough. It turns out though, it's about five minutes for a question, especially like a retro question. Now you might have some questions that are much more complicated. For example, you could use this exact technique for uh, design. Let's design on in silence what this screen should look like and everyone do it on their own and then we'll share ideas and combine and build on. There's a design studio that you could use. It's the exact same technique if you think about it, but obviously designing a screen and sketching it out by pencil would be longer than five minutes. Maybe, maybe not. Design studio actually gives you only like three or four minutes usually, but depending on the activity, it could be longer. But for a general question, I give people four or five minutes. Um, that's, that's what I do. Really cool. Um, you were talking earlier before before this meetup started about one of your customers, uh, John Silver, that you were uh, that you were, <laughs> and I'm wondering what his reaction and, and other customers' reactions have been when you've introduced this technique actually with your customers. Again, they've just loved it. Um, that's that's how it goes because they can see the engagement. They can see. Like if you haven't done product retrospectives like this at all, and you have a product, internal product or external product, like ours is global, so we, we do it globally. Uh, but even if you're doing a product change or a, a software change for the accounting team uh, down the hall, well, formerly down the hall now, down the virtual hall, it's still worth doing a product retrospective to say, what should the next thing we do for you be? Is the product good enough? Maybe, maybe it's all, all uh, there aren't any anchors. Maybe it's just all motors and destinations that are already met, but that's generally not true. And I've never had anyone say, well, that was really dumb. I really didn't appreciate being asked or engaged or involved. They've all said they're quite, quite the opposite. Yeah, please don't engage me. I can see people asking that. Listen, yeah. um, I've got a couple of questions here um, still still to go, but I do want to be conscious of the time. It is a little after 6.30, and so sometimes folks have to drop off. So if you do have to drop off, first of all, thank you so much for joining us tonight. Please join us on the YouTube channel where you'll be able to find this and many others. Um, there's also a feedback link being posted right now in the chat window. If you click on that feedback link and have to leave, um, sorry you can't stay. Uh, we know Steve went over time. I'm going to totally blame him, by the way. <laughs> 
Uh, but per, please provide the feedback. And if you are staying, that's great because I do have a couple more questions, Steve. Starting with, starting with the, you know, you've introduced this technique as a great way to generate ideas, and you've talked about retrospectives, and you talked about product development. When don't we use this technique? When isn't it appropriate? Sure. Uh, when it's just yourself, uh, you wouldn't need to do the group work, right? Or when your results don't matter. So if you really don't care about the results or like sometimes I don't, it's like uh, A or B, it's fine, let's go. Because uh, it does take a little extra time, not a lot, but that's, yep. that's my general answer. If you care about your results and you care about engaging the people, this technique is way better than the alternative one you're already going to take time to do. Okay. Couple of other questions that have come up. Um, uh, there's there's a great question here from uh, from Selesh asking about uh, some people who who really thrive on seeing other people's answers. Yeah, and I'm wondering if there's a technique maybe that you've already mentioned where you can continue to generate new ideas while you're still hearing ideas. Yeah. So remember, we always start with the silent brainstorming, and occasionally I have people. Uh, uh, I've done enough of these that it's thousands of people that I've led through these sessions in like both at clients or at my own company or elsewhere. Um, occasionally, I, I can remember one person who's like, I can't, I can't think without talking. So that one person, I'm like, just hold on, there's going to be an awesome talking session because once we're done the silent brainstorming, which will take about five minutes, um, we're going to talk about all of these ideas out loud. And that is when you exactly should be building on each other's idea and talking about them and engaging them. That's where the debate does matter. Does that answer so the it's question? All, it's all right in this technique. Just, just, just to make this explicit, it's all right to generate ideas after you've done the silent brainstorming part. That is the debate. That's the you, you know, you show you the green and you say it's red. I'm like, what the heck is that? Oh, green lantern, right? That's the epiphany you're looking for. It's the what do you like? That's where the that idea is crazy, but it makes me think of this happens. By the way, um, that's when you said green, I thought of red. So maybe I'm the problem. Uh, likely. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. I know Jeff too well. <laughs> it, it wouldn't be the first time. Um, I also liked, by the way, that you talked in, in, in here about throwing out wrong ideas because I built an yeah. entire career of being wrong. <laughs> I have occasionally, for example, because apparently shouting out a wrong idea does cause your brain to reassess things. When my kids are like, I can't find my shoes. I will say, well, have you looked on the roof or, you know, some dumb answer. And they're like, what? Oh, I know where they are. That does happen. Um, it's a little anecdotal for me to say science, but uh, it is quite funny as a parent. Yeah, it's a little bit like the, uh, you know, the, the doorway effect when you walk into a room to get something. And as soon as you walk in, you forget what it was. And, you know, it, it's kind of some sort of some sort of brain, I don't know, thing that yeah. other people who are smarter than me know about. Yeah. Um, uh, is it Rommel or Rommel? I'm not sure. It, talking in the chat about liberating structures, one, two, four, all activity, et cetera. Uh, like 100%. That is exactly right. If you look at uh, liberating structures, almost any retrospective technique, um, you look at even planning poker. If you're like, I know not everyone's doing that anymore. It kind of lost its favor, but it's silent brainstorming at work. It's That's what it is. Um, it's generate out loud and put your card on your head, forehead, or wherever you do it, right? You don't show your answer to the rest of the group and then you debate. There are so many things that already use this and that's what I started to notice. I'm like, there's, there's gotta be something behind this. And then an article popped up like, ah, that's why this all makes sense. That's why this all works. That's why people feel engaged. Jane said the same thing about gathering all of the worst ideas. And I've seen that done, you know, if this was the worst sprint ever, what would that have, you know, how did, yep. how did we make it look like the worst sprint? It's brilliant, right? It's that's the my worst net, nightmare technique from the innovation games book. I actually used that this morning with our with about 50 people on our team. We were talking about peer feedback. So we brainstormed the worst peer feedback with drawing pictures first in groups. And it was pretty fun just to, to kick off the conversation before we talked about good feedback. One of the things you talked about was Miro. I'm wondering if there's any other tools that you've used and kind of along the same question, yeah. I'm going to piggyback two questions here, which you're not supposed to do, but I'm going to. Um, <laughs> but in this in this virtual world where we're using these tools, um, have you noticed any drawbacks as people put cards up on things like Mural where it's all public as soon as you post the card? Uh, Miro has password functionality now. So that's good. So for example, if there's two parts to the question. I was, I think I answered the wrong one because um, you know we put some strategic stuff on Miro and if you got the link, you could access it. That's probably not what you meant, but I think what you meant is 
getting everyone to just put their cards on it all the time as they're brainstorming. So when we're doing it online, I ask them not to do that. Um, so there's two ways you could do it. First, you silent brainstorm first, but you don't have people write their own cards on the mirror board. You write them in, if you're on a PC and notepad or, or if you're on in notes on in your notes app on Mac or wherever you write it. I use Evernote, for example, for a lot of my note taking. Write it anywhere else first. You can even write it on post-it notes at your desk if you want. And then when I'm facilitating the round robin part where we're doing the group, like, all right, Jeff, what's your idea? And you have two choices. Jeff, can you paste, put your idea and type it in right now? Or um, often when I'm doing it with clients, for example, virtually they don't have rights to Miro, only I do. I get them to say it out loud and I paste it in Miro and then I type their idea in. And that also allows me the chance to shorten their idea because often it can be quite long. Post-it notes are great physically because they make you write short. Um, virtually you have a little bit more problem with that. People like to write long. There's, uh, there's another tool out there that, uh, that I've heard people using called Fun Retro. Yeah. And Fun Retro is similar in that it, it allows you to do this. But uh, someone's mentioned to me here just in the chat that it gives you the ability to uh, hide the cards so people can populate it and they yes. only get revealed when you click the button. And now you know why they do that. It's science. Yep, I've seen that one too. There's a couple like that. When I was a couple of years ago, I investigated a bunch of tools. Not all of them had that. I'm like, well, I'm not using that tool because they were just type and everyone sees it. That's That's not what we're going for here. Yeah, and Lack has mentioned that Mural has a new privacy mode where the facilitator yeah. can turn it off, similar to, I guess, what Fun Retro is doing. Lots Brilliant. of tools, lots of ways to do this, Steve. This has been a fantastic sort of uh, a fantastic little chat. If, if people wanted to get more information on it, what's the best way or, or how, where, where, do, where do you find more information on this? Well, I'm assuming you're going to put this in video. I'm uh, on YouTube. I, I know I have slides from a long time ago that give lots and lots of i'm going to put it in the chat here uh if i got the right one there's slides from long ago but if it's got more slides than i talked through today because you only gave me uh 15 minutes in quotes um but there's lots of links at the end to all the studies and stuff like that that you can read yes and there's twitter thank you uh so you there's tons of information out there but the last two slides in that deck are links to the, all the studies and resources and examples and stuff like that so tons of you can tons out there Steve, this has been absolutely fantastic. Uh, just a reminder, folks, for those of you on the call, we are going to wrap it up at this point. But thank you so much for joining. And please take a few moments to complete the feedback link, which is in the chat window as well. Take a minute to click that link before you leave the uh, Zoom call here, just so you get the uh, get the opportunity to, to provide some feedback. Um, hopefully, we will see you back in a few weeks for our next session. But uh, Tom, uh, John, uh, Trish, I'm going to pass it back over to you. Noel? Thanks, Thanks Jeff. very much. That was great. Thank you. Great.